For the second year in a row, the city of Columbus has been named one of the top seven intelligent communities in the world by the Intelligent Community Forum. The Intelligent Community Forum, or ICF, is a New York-based international think tank that studies the world's cities to discover and then share the strategies used to create an intelligent community. In the past month, Intelligent Community Forum co-founder John Jung visited Columbus to review the initiatives that led to Columbus being named one of the top seven intelligent communities in the world for 2014. He will then submit his report to a large international group of experts. And in June, at the annual Intelligent Community Forum Summit in New York City, the Intelligent Community for 2014 will be announced. Part of John Jung's visit here included a roundtable meeting with businesses and community leaders entitled Community as Canvas. Its purpose was to discuss the three dimensions of the Columbus culture, culture as art, culture as history and heritage, and culture as attitude. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here today and I'll, um, I'll introduce myself and then let everyone go around the table and introduce themselves briefly. I think you've met everyone, but my name is Ruth Milligan and I'm here um, sort of in my role as the TEDx Columbus curator. I'm Tom Katzenmeyer. I'm president of the Greater Columbus Arts Council. I've been in that job one year as of today. Today's my <laughs> one year. <laughs> April 1st. Yes. Uh, it's not a joke. Uh, I hope you've had a good visit. Very good. Yeah. yeah good. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Brian Ross and I'm president and CEO of Experience Columbus. And I've been in my job uh, a year as of uh, January, so a little bit longer than Tom, but we came in together. We're sort of attached at the hip. Uh, but again, hope you're having a tremendous stay here. We're glad to have you in Columbus. Fantastic. Thank you. Hi, I'm Doug Kreidler. I'm president and CEO of the Columbus Foundation. Uh, for 18 years, I headed up a local arts organization that managed a number of theaters in town and presented arts and entertainment. But I've been at the Columbus Foundation as its CEO for uh, 12 years. Hi, I'm Jenny Brittenbauer. I'm the founder of Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams, and I've been in my job my whole life, I believe. <laughs> and I've enjoyed your ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm John Young, and I've been with uh, ICF for, well, we started in 1999, but it actually goes back to early 90s. So uh, the Intelligent Community Forum, and uh, that's the reason I'm here, is to um, evaluate the city and to basically uh, enjoy meeting all of you and the rest of the community uh, during this time. Have you been before? I've had a very short uh, visit by a, a colleague out of uh, Dublin who took us through the uh, German village, and that's about it. Yeah, great. Had a beer there. Mm -hmm. That's what you do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a nice visit. Maybe a Bahama Mama, too, or two. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Um, so we're going to um, frame this conversation today. We were asked to really share some insight with you about culture in Columbus. And I thought I'd share a one-minute story myself just to get us kicked off um, about sort of why I'm here. I mean, TEDx is one thing. But um, in uh, 1969, my father got a job, and uh, they told him he could pick one of three cities. They could go to Columbus, Dayton, or Cincinnati, he got a job with the Justice Department. He was a small town lawyer in Sydney. And he tells the story about why he chose Columbus in 1969, which was that he used to listen to this minister um, broadcast his sermons from the church, which is just down the street, Broad Street Presbyterian. And he used to steal um, away with my mother to come over to the symphony on occasion. And he knew that all the schools were good in all the cities, and he knew that they would you know, find a nice house, but he was really attracted to Columbus because of those two small cultural aspects. And so he spent the rest of his time in Columbus, and up until his death a few years ago, really exploring it with the whole family. And we did crazy things to learn about Columbus and experience it for the last 40 years. But one of the things he did was he joined a group of, of guys who would get together once a month and share papers on topics unrelated to their professions. This group has been around for 100 years in Columbus, and I used to go on occasion and be envious as, as his date, and I used to go and be envious of the idea sharing that used to happen. And so when the TEDx Columbus, or the TEDx program was announced five years ago, it answered my question, which was how can I have that same sort of fun, intellectual, diverse, um, cross-cultural idea sharing. And so that's what inspired me to start and curate the first TEDx five years ago which is why I was invited here today to help host this conversation and answer a few questions that we have, we're have we posing for you, and you may have others that we'd like to answer about um, Columbus's 
culture. And we've we sort of broken it down into three questions and sort of three categories about heritage, art, and attitude. So the three questions that we have uh, curated, if you will, is you know, how, what have we tra tra traditionally done well in these categories and how do we continue to build on them? The second is what, did, what were we handed that doesn't work well for us or where we've made a big mistake and used sort of art and attitude to overcome it? And the last is where are we planting seeds for the future? So I'll stop there and say, are, are there any other questions that are burning in your mind that no, you want to uh, Let's get going and I'll see if there are some things that come out of the dialogue. Great. So I'm going to turn it over to Doug and let him start. And I have a few photos to augment where necessary. I didn't, I didn't, we didn't do a big fancy presentation. We didn't think that that was necessary for today. Right. But um, so we're going to start with Doug just on some heritage points about sort of how we've been building sure. on those. Thank you. And I, I just want to say that our, our hostess uh, of this conversation is an extraordinary uh, gift to this community because well, it just gets easily summarized as TEDx, okay, another TEDx, another community. It is really a, a truly exceptional experience. And she's been celebrated by TED, uh, the main TED conference, and, and really uh, lifted up as, as one of the premier leaders in that whole movement, uh, the TEDx uh, community forum. So bra brava to you. Um, well, so Tom mentioned it's a significant anniversary uh, for him. Uh, there's another significant anniversary uh, in Columbus that's uh, right now. It's actually a 27-day anniversary, which is unusual, obviously. Uh, but the anniversary is one of uh, achievement, but it's also one that is, uh, I think, defining and distinguishing about our community. And it is um, the accomplishment that finds the first woman to fly solo around the world was not the default answer that comes to most minds, which is Amelia Earhart, but was a woman named Jerry Mock, who lived in Columbus, who took off from Columbus, and landed in Columbus 50 years ago. So one, that's an unknown story. Two is it's a source of inspiration for us as a community, because among other things, the name of her plane was the Spirit of Columbus. And today it's hoisted up above the Smithsonian Institution. And it was 50 years ago. And the reason I say 27 days is that's how long it took to do the flight. Uh, but it is, from our standpoint in this community, also very much reflective of what distinguishes us. And we talk about heritage. Uh, we talk about really what's making a difference in this community and um, possibly making it attractive to your organization. Uh, I would think that that spirit, uh, that sense of achievement, that sa sense of collaboration and uh, commonality of interest, that we are co-creating a magnificent community. And I'll, in, a, in a few minutes, I'll um, get a chance to talk a little bit about what makes that unique in a time frame of a, of a cycle in a community. But the people around this table, the people behind you, uh, and the people you've met in this community, all share a common commitment, a common understanding that this is our time, our time of contribution, our time of leadership. Uh, and we take that very seriously. And we keep each other honest about the effort that we owe each other, the integrity, the honesty, the truly collaborative spirit that we uh, owe each other. And I'll just close with another uh, quick uh, community story, and that is um, Lewis Mumford, the historian, uh, wrote about Rome years ago. And in studying Rome, he, in very carefully, he found that um, before the actual decline of Rome was able to be detected, they, it was, as they look back now, you can see that the people of Rome had lost their inner go. And that's, those are the exact words that he used. And one of the things that's really compelling, I hope you felt it during your time here, about this community is that we have our inner go fully intact, that there is a, something very exciting about, as I say, co-creating a magnificent community that, that not only hopefully has assets and resources that you can identify as best in, in breed, but also has the possibilities and the energies about uh, the uh, future. So I want to follow up on something that Doug just said, and that is uh, collaboration, because it is the expectation here now in Columbus between nonprofits, between nonprofits in the business world, 
Um, there are many examples of that. There are a handful of nonprofit leaders in the audience here who all are major collaborators. Pat Lisinski from the library, Christy Vargo from the Audubon Center, Monica Kreidler from Momentum. And it is really our way of life. I am a little bit on fire right now because I'm in the middle of a grant making cycle. And so I have the advantage of talking to all 28 organizations that are coming in right now to see us. And I'm hearing about what they have coming. And it is really remarkable. There's two that I want to call out to you. One is one that Nanette Macy Junes and the Museum of Art are doing. And that's a project called Echoes. And it's a um, partnership with Shadowbox, which is a theater company uh, in the brewery district. Here And what they're doing is Shadowbox, with the help of Mills James, has come to the Art Museum and filmed 91 uh, works of art that are in the permanent collection of the museum. And they haven't just come and taken pictures of them, because I got to see the preview of this, but they've come and filmed them in a 3D way that you actually, when they show it on a big screen, you feel like you are actually in the painting. And it's the most remarkable thing. and it. Uh, premieres a month from today at Shadowbox. They've created an original score with their house band to it, so they're going to be playing original music to it, and they're going to have narrators and poets and such comment on it, but it is going to be one of those things not to be missed, and I wish you would come back <laughs> so I could take you to it, but it's only going to run for one week, and I think it's going to be one of those things that people are going to regret that they didn't get to see it because they're going to hear about it afterwards. So the second one that I talk about is something called Twisted. And it's a collaboration between the opera, the ballet, and the symphony that's going to open the arts season this fall uh, in September. They're going to all be on the stage together. We have a lot of great new artistic talent in Columbus. Edward Lang, who's the artistic director of the ballet. David Dansmeyer, who's the artistic director of Pro Musica. These folks are really bringing us new things, new ideas that they're creating, and it's just going to be fantastic. So you can also come back for that. I'd like to have you come back for that, too. So. But collaboration is the expectation here now. And obviously, I echo that. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, uh, it is the expectation. And, and our success, I've uh, been in the community now for just about eight years. And uh, to see how not only is collaboration spoken of, but acted on. And uh, it has really put our community, as Doug said, in a very special place. And so I'm sort of talking about attitude. And obviously, as a Midwest city, uh, when I arrived here about eight years ago, um, we were respectful and modest. Um, and one of the things that we do in our position as Experience Columbus at Convention Visitors Bureau is we compete for visitors into our destination. So we wanted to go and see how some of our other cities were doing things and sort of uh, look at benchmarking. And one of the cities that uh, we've always considered as our competitor was uh, Indianapolis. So a bunch of us got in a van, drove three hours over to Indianapolis. Um, actually, I was driving, it was about two and a half. But <laughs> we drove three hours over to uh, uh, Indianapolis. And we had scheduled with them uh, a lot of their hospitality community leaders to meet with us so that we could exchange um, best practices. So we uh, took uh, a day and talked to some of the hotel leaders, um, some of the attraction leaders, um, some of the uh, uh, different um, uh, uh, restaurant and, and uh, bars and things of that sort. But then we were able to sit down with the Convention Visitors Bureau which helps do a lot of uh, the packaging and selling of the particular city. And we were amazed of how willing they were to share everything with us to AT. Basically, they took out their playbook and said, here's what we do. Gave us names of groups, types of groups, and really went down through the list. And of course, we're all writing down very diligently, taking copious notes. Um, and at the end, we sort of asked the question, so who do you consider to be your competitive set? Columbus never came up. Here we were sitting here thinking we were on the same playing field. And 
had a lot of the same attributes, some even better. Uh, however, they did not consider our community a competitor. So you really took that modesty and, and uh, um, you know, respectfulness and we brought that back. And through that, we sort of, com you know, as our community has as well, looked at it and uh, turned that into a competitiveness, um, a confidence, and really some pride. Because we took a lot of pride in the fact of what we had and how excited we are to talk about our city. But others weren't looking at us the way we were looking at ourselves. Um, and again, to have that transformation begin, it was about collaboration. I'd add something to that. So he's being a little bit modest. We did the same thing with Nashville yes. about six months ago, where Brian led a delegation to Nashville that I got to go on. Same type of experience. And Doug uh, led a group up to Grand Rapids last fall, where we got to go to this wonderful conference and I got to learn about something called the Art Prize, which is their version of our festival that we do here, which was incredibly amazing. And it's just kind of an automatic thing. It's how we think. I mean, Doug just said, like, who could benefit from going with me to Grand Rapids of all places? And I was on that list. <laughs> So let's turn a little bit for any questions that you had from any of those stories. That we're no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to listen a little bit more to this uh, equation of collaboration mm -hmm. and uh, what that means as part of uh, this whole exercise. So I've heard it uh, here in this community over and over again. It's one of your strengths. Uh, but I've heard now a couple of other words that I've not heard before. Uh, Co-creation and uh, Columbus has its goal. Uh, as well as um, collaboration is expected now. Uh, so I'd like to go a little bit further into those when you have a moment. Sure. Okay. And you may hear a few examples in the next round too, but okay. if we don't hit them, I know these uh, guys are percolating with examples. So okay. um, We also know that uh, stories that resonate uh, around a city are ones where we can show some friction or contra, meaning where have we made a mistake or what did we inherit that didn't work um, so we just want to talk about sort of obstacles and how we've overcome those and I'll look to Doug to start off again in terms of the big picture of what yeah. Columbus had and doesn't have so we don't have a geographic point of distinction we don't have a mountain an ocean um, that distinguishes our identity right up front um, now Les Wexner would argue that he'd rather place the city as we are placed strategically with population centers uh, easily accessible than on the coast where you can boast of an ocean but you have you know half of your circle of influence in terms of accessibility and so forth are fish so you know better to be placed actually strategically where, where, you are, where we are placed but the simple fact is is we were not we're not founded on or at a, a place of geographic distinction. And what's interesting about that is we are also not founded on a navigable waterway. And that has paid benefits to us. Because you're coming to us at a time when we are clearly on the rise. Over the next 26 uh, years, Columbus is expected to increase its population by 25%, actually just shy of 24% was the calculation. The rest of Ohio is set to decline by 13%. And so just in that one stat alone, you could see the, the growth um, of our city. But the fact is, is we weren't founded on a navigable waterway, which means we're not tied to old industry. We weren't uh, uh, based, our economy wasn't based around old industry. And so we're calibrated to the now. And that is why it's a remarkable and going to be a remarkable success story going forward because we understand that. We understand uh, the obligation that we have to make the most of that uh, during uh, our time. Um, Mark Kwame is a uh, prominent uh, venture capitalist, um, uh, if, I, if you will, sort of blue blood, Silicon Valley. Um, uh, his father was one of the co-founders of National Semiconductor. And, uh, he uh, uh, was with Sequoia, which is one of the, you know, the, the large venture capital firms that have invested in a number of, of startups and technology that are household names around the world now. 
he was invited uh, and asked to come to Columbus to head up a private jobs initiative uh, in partnership with the state. And when he finished that tour of duty recently, of course, the assumption was that he would go back to um, Silicon Valley. But instead, he decided to stay here. And he has all the options in the world. And he stayed here and developed, is now developing a venture capital firm here in Columbus, Ohio, because in his words, the next 30 years are going to be very good to the Midwest and very, very good to Columbus, Ohio. And so that you can get a sense from folks like Mark who have all the options in the world and don't take it from uh, we who have been here and call it home and we work to, to advance it, but somebody who is in a position to sort of independently uh, assess the situation and finds that this is a remarkable place, a remarkable time. And so the idea of not being on a navigable waterway, the idea of not having a mountain, the idea of not having an ocean nearby could very well end up being uh, a benefit and a positive and an opportunity for us and therefore an obstacle that we have overcome. have a picture to start with if you want to talk about that one. That's amazing. I'm it's not sure idea. if you were uh, able to get around downtown, sort of the core mm -hmm. of downtown. Were you able to drive by uh, Columbus Commons, uh, the green space right downtown? So one of the things, particularly from, from our industry and really from the community, um, there used to be a very vibrant uh, downtown mall, uh, city center mall. Uh, had uh, three anchor um, department stores, 150 specialty shops, really drove a lot of tourism and, and residential traffic, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 traffic from the um, uh, residents of Columbus into downtown to do a lot of business. Well, over a period of time, that sort of went away. And uh, in 2009, the mall closed. And you could sort of hear the air going out of the balloon. And the, the part that was drawing a lot of economic development, a lot of uh, 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 visitors, uh, a lot of people to downtown was no longer there. So we were sort of at a crossroads. And you talk about determination, you talk about vision, you talk about collaboration. One of the things that we do very well here is that public-private uh, collaboration. And so instead of, there were many things that were talked about of what to do with this building. One was a casino, a lot of different things. Um, but a lot of people really sat down and some put uh, you know, their best interest aside for the greater good of the community to try to find to put something down there that would draw people to the core of our city. And it was built, seven acres of green space, um, they did over 230 events the first time that uh, they opened, uh, the first year where they were open. A lot of family-based um, events, which really helped the urban vitality uh, in, in bringing people downtown. It has, as a lot of people say, that green space drives development. And if you drive around there, as I'm sure you probably saw, you see a lot of uh, development from a residential standpoint. Not only that, it's brought new, new uh, shops, new restaurants. Uh, it spurred other development along our riverfront with the uh, Scioto Mile, um, sort of what we uh, look at as our uh, uh, Millennium Park um, from Chicago. So one of the things, again, um, as I would share, is just that we took something that was, could have been very detrimental to our downtown but really rallied and, and found a way to make it now one of our great assets. We were actually, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with golf, but the President's Cup, it's an international uh, competition. We did the opening ceremonies from Columbus Commons. People internationally, globally, saw what our community was able to do and, and just saw that energy down there. But the golf course was in Dublin, so yeah. meaning that they were able to attract the event to downtown. So. So it's another thing that really helps us um, uh, sell the city now and, and bring both from a residential side and a visitor side. It's become a true asset. So somewhat related to that, uh, where there have been many obstacles and eyesores, is a neighborhood called Franklinton, which is what I would like to talk to you about. I don't know whether you had a chance to drive around over there on your short 
trip here. It's where the center of science and industry is, COSI is. Uh, it's a tough neighborhood right now. The poverty, the poverty stats are bad. There's boarded up houses. There's a lot of vacant property over there. The warehouses, all the windows are broken out in them. Um, it was never, it's, and it's sort of half of our downtown. I mean, if you look at downtown from the air, there's the river, then there's where all the skyscrapers are, and then there's Franklinton on the other side. It was the original settlement of Columbus, Ohio, way back, more than 200 years ago now, because we just did our bicentennial. But it was never developed because there wasn't a flood wall. And there was a flood wall put in courtesy of the federal government probably 10 years ago, maybe five, 10 years ago. So now it can be fully developed. There's no fear of a 100-year flood there. And the whole city has come together to work on this. And nonprofits and arts organizations are leading the way. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. But I'm talking about the business community, the city leaders, uh, so the mayor, all of city council, all the county commissioners uh, putting money into this project. The first manifestation of it is the taking out of the Main Street Dam. So you might have noticed if you, as you were driving over one of those bridges that the river level is down. There's going to be 33 acres of new parkland created over there. The zoo is going to build a rainforest feature. Vets Memorial, the Veterans Memorial, the, is going to be torn down and there's going to be quite the show place built there. It's been funded by the state in the state capital bill. There's 15 million dollars for that project. So it's like ev everyone is in on it. Uh, when I say the nonprofits are leading the way, several nonprofits are moving there or have already relocated there. Uh, there are 97 working artists in uh, that, actually that building right there, um, that are renting loft space and have been there probably for two years now. There's a new bar and restaurant that opened as part of that building called Strongwater. Um, the Harmony Project, which is a community choir that has a service component to it, is moving over there into an old church. I just met yesterday with the folks from Glass Access, which is a glass blowing um, nonprofit that's going to open over there with a Cafe Brioso inside. And whether you guys all knew that yet or not, uh, with, their, with their wares, and you'll be able to go there and take glass blowing classes. Uh, it's, it's quite the amazing, amazing thing. That photo is of the groundbreaking for the Idea Foundry. So you'll see the mayor, and I think Alex Fisher, or Alex Bendar, um, racing robots there. It's kind of a um, set up uh, a la gym membership where you pay a monthly fee and you can come there and use their equipment to invent things and build new things. They have um, 3D printers there, equipment like that oh, to use. You were there last night. Great. So you got to. Do you know the largest? Gotta, be the largest maker. Do you and race a, and there's race a robot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, but we were thinking about playing around with a 3D printer. But there you go. There you go. So this is the next neighborhood. I like to think that the arts and cultural organizations are leading the way, but it's totally with the entire city, elected, corporate, et cetera, et cetera, behind them. All of us, many of the people in this room have worked on this. It's, I, I promise you, when you come back in a year, it's going to look different when you come back in two years, three years, four years, five years. There'll be people living down there. There'll be shops. There'll be a Jenny's ice cream. Can I promise that today? <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> sure, the wheels are turning. Yes. <laughs> Um, and it's actually where I want to locate our offices also. So we're working on that with the city. The mayor's been very helpful on that to us too. So that is the next new neighborhood that's going to take off. And the city also has given the Arts Council a $100,000 um, grant to run a community impact program. So we're funding um, job creation activities in that neighborhood also. So it's the complete package. Great. So any questions you want to ask about those stories? Look, we still have plenty of time. Oh, we do. All right. Well, uh, transformation is a, a theme that uh, the Intelligent Community Forum talks about and how cities have transformed and 
how leadership and collaboration uh, has been very important as part of that. And of course, uh, what I'm seeing here is a very strong sense of pride, but also a strong sense of relationships. And that uh, is how collaboration works. It's not so much simple cooperation because you don't really have to like anybody. Uh, you don't have to trust anybody in cooperation. What you really need is in collaboration, that whole sense of trust. And that seems to be something I'm sensing in this community. Everybody seems to know each other. They seem to like each other. And uh, there's a sense of trust. And that's, uh, I think, very important, especially as you start to transform these neighborhoods. It's very much true. I remember going to a number of meetings between two civic organizations who you would think would be cooperating on, in a certain realm. And this was 15, 18 years ago. And they would meet, and they'd have this nice meeting. And then they would, since I was on the board of both, I'd, I'd see the reactions to both organizations. And they both would go back and say, that's in our sandbox. They're not getting in our sandbox. And today it is truly, truly different. And this idea that this is our expectation of each other. Pat Lazinski, is, as Tom mentioned, is back there, runs arguably the best metropolitan library uh, system in, in America. He and others of, of, uh, of us are, um, get together every once in a while that are in positions like ours. And it's the idea of sharing information, but also it is about, as I said before, sort of keeping each other honest in the effort that this is honest and true collaboration. Because this is, again, uh, this is our time of contribution and leadership. And people across at this table and elsewhere take that very seriously. And so it's, it's, um, it's a, it is a core value. It's not just a talking point. And I think you can see it in the last example as well, that Alex Bandar has done all of this work with the Idea Foundry while having a full-time job. And there's no way he would be able to have started it initially, grown it, and it, grown it to its existing, and then moving it to this location without that collaboration. Just no way possible. Can I have a further question on your point? Yeah. Um, how do you maintain this? as the city grows and you have an additional 25% growth, mm -hmm. uh, how are you going to be able to keep the essence of what is happening now yeah. uh, in the next 25 years? Well, I want to give credit uh, first to the public sector leadership because they too are highly collaborative to a point where you don't see in a lot of uh, communities and there's stability at the, in the leadership roles that uh, has been helpful. But I also want to give a lot of credit to the business leadership because they have, to use their CEO's um, words, uh, decided to stack hands. They've decided that for all the fact that the majority of most of their business is done outside of Columbus, you know, they are headquarters for various uh, companies. But, you know, you take an insurance company, a bank or whatever, the majority of the business is done if you aggregate it more outside the community than inside the community. Typical reaction to that is business folks that have other priorities and home is not necessarily the priority. Here it is. And there's also in that um, uh, cooperative, if you will, uh, there is an expectation that, that they are defining the values, that they are defining muscle memory of what it is to be a Columbus leader. That's a very conscious thing. And so that coming together and working together and identifying complex issues like public education to things that would be more immediately intuitive to be in their interest like you know, economic development, the whole range though, uh, they, they are together, they stayed together and they are undertaking significant uh, challenges and facing significant challenges in our community. And so I think they also signal to the rest of the community that this is an expectation. Um, uh, this is the way it's done in Columbus. And that really helps reinforce that outside of their own sphere. I also want to just add to that, think, I know this, that we are bringing along the next group too. I really believe that in all of our work. I know it's very top of mind for all the arts and culture organizations, how to engage the millennials uh, in everything, giving, board activity, volunteering, um, 
Tanisha Robinson's here in the audience. She's probably at least 30 years younger than me. She is um, advising a committee of my board right now on that very topic with a couple other folks of her age. And we've actually given them a little bit of money to work with also that they could grant out to start a project or whatever. So it's very, I know it's a conscious effort on all of our parts to do that. And, and from the business community, and, and probably not even as uh, Tom was saying, that the business community, the community as a whole is also a big initiative for attracting and retaining talent across all sectors in all age groups so that we're trying to get the best of the best and it's not you know again it becomes part of the culture part of the um, the, the way we do things so it is uh, uh, something that as a community is always on top of mind for all of us so we just had one more um, point we wanted to make and then I was going to turn it over to Jenny to sort of I am getting restless. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell, and we can go straight to Jenny. <laughs> why don't we set up? Um, why don't we just set up a little bit of smart and open, um, and sort of what some of our core attributes are, and then we'll let Jenny play in there. So, so a few years before our bicentennial, which <clears throat> occurred uh, two years ago, uh, the mayor called and asked if um, I would co-lead an effort to. Uh, bring uh, some st further strategy to our strategic communications about our city and, and to our own citizens as well. And, um, you know, I, I sort of kidded him and said, you know, it's a bit of a death wish because that whole idea of branding a, a place is, can be elusive and has been elusive here in Columbus as, as, again, geographically not, there's no one default thing that you can point to, oh, we've got these great mountains, visit us or you know, we're proud of them and, and uh, they are of distinction. Uh, but Nancy Kramer, who runs um, a significant uh, digital, digital marketing uh, company in, in town with a worldwide reach, and I were asked to, to convene this group. And what we did was we distilled from citizens' voices. So this is, not, this is a, a good case in point where we, we honor uh, the the fact that good ideas aren't the exclusive province of those who work in skyscrapers, that they are very much owned by and possessed by people whose feet are on the street as well. And so by honoring that, uh, by doing the exercise that way, we honored that and heard from thousands and thousands of inputs uh, from our citizens about uh, what is distinctive about our community. And these aren't meant to be uh, the, a, a slogan but just the brand attributes of what is distinctive. And so from that came two that were distilled, smart and open. And smart is uh, to um, identify the assets, whether they be higher education, uh, the fact that we have the world's largest independent research and development organization in town, again, the smart uh, asset that is our library system, uh, the science museum, the zoo, so on, chem abstracts, which is the number one, I'm sure you've you heard about all these already, but uh, the number one chemical database uh, resource in the world. These are distinctive, top of class, smart assets that have to do with knowledge uh, and understanding, whether that understanding be of the animal kingdom or of chemical research. So that was one. The other was open. And open is meant to suggest and reflect the fact that it is so easy to get engaged here. It is so easy to be embraced no matter what your lifestyle is. It is so um, a permeable a place to make a contribution so that an open place, which we are, this was an attribute, this wasn't uh, something we wanted to become. But I will get back to that in a second because both of these are both attributes, but they're also aspirations. You've got to work at maintaining them. You can't just one day be them, and that's good. Check it off the list. But they're attributes and aspirations. And people own them now. Is This nomenclature has, has just sunk in as, as, as attributes or values. They've really uh, taken on um, a, a dimension of not only identifying these things, but also aspiring to them. And open in the end is about opportunity, uh, and that is obviously what we want to be 
and, and uh, Tom mentioned Tanisha, and there are others in this community that are, are desiring to make a big difference, and they're just building, and clearly one of the, the chiefs among those uh, is sitting to my left, and, and Jenny, not only an amazingly articulate person, which is why she's getting restless, because she has so much to say, uh, and, and, and to say so well, uh, but others in, uh, in, in the younger realm who desire to build something here and make a difference here, and, and it is a place where you can get access, engage, get resourced, and be able to fulfill uh, your uh, potential. And so that's what is contained within the, uh, the open dimension of that smart and open. And they are combined, um, we think, make us a, a distinguishing and distinctive community. So Jenny. Mm -hmm. We talked about, Jenny has a very big story to share, and it's a treat to have her here today, so thanks for being here. Thank you, you guys have been so inspiring, mm -hmm. and I'm just sitting here like, yes, yeah. that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, what I asked her to do was to talk from the angle of, of how she was able to start you know, her business and have it grow with sort of these attributes about smart and open, or what sort of art and attitude and heritage she was able to play into. As she, as she started one business and then, and then another, so. Well, I mean, I think my business is a, um, is a reflection of the community. It's completely been raised by this community. Um, I started in the North Market, um, which is our indoor public market in downtown Columbus. I, I tell the story a lot of times outside of Columbus, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> but um, um, uh, I started in 1996 making ice creams there, and um, didn't know anything about ice cream or business or, or people or much about food, actually, either. Um, and, and slowly, by working in the North Market, I didn't realize I didn't know what I didn't know, but um, I was able to learn so much. And so my first business was called Scream Ice Cream, and we were open for four years there. Um, and then I closed it up in Jenny's in the same spot two years later um, in 2002. Or we closed in 2000 and then opened Jenny's in 2002 in the same location. But that time that I spent in the North Market over the counter, talking to customers, talking to merchants, um, learning about food um, is um, the, probably the most important time in my life, total of eight years um, just spent learning about um, customer preferences, learning about um, how flavors play to our customers, and also um, doing my best to achieve the, the standard of quality that the, the customers in Columbus expected. Um, and there are many stories about that. Uh, one time I did a, a black currant yogurt and my French customer, who's an economics professor at Ohio State, came in and, with her husband, as she did every Saturday and still does. Um, and she tasted my black currant sorbet, which is you know, big in France, but I had never been, so I was doing it best I could. And her husband said to her, how is it? And she said, it is shit. <laughs> and I was so deflated as I was many times with her critique. But the next time she came in and had it, of course I asked her why and, and learned about it. And the next time she came in and had it, it got better. And the next time it got better and finally it was approved. Um, but that's just one of many um, of those kinds of experiences that I had at the North Market. Um, in many different things from service to um, business and, um, and of course, all our ice cream flavors. Um, but then outside of the market also, just the nurturing community that is Columbus, um, the inspiring past that we've had and being in the middle of Columbus, being in a very old building, but also just being in the short north, you know, and, and having um, seen that over the last 30, 40 years, you know, um, become what it's become and having that to reach back on and then uh, mentors to go forward with and so Jenny, so Jenny started in 2002 at the North Market. When did you open the Grandview store? So she opened her first 2006. Two, so four years later and so talk a little about how you picked where to take your first store. And so we, um, we chose Grandview for our first store. Grandview is one of many walkable um, down, uh, neighborhoods in Columbus. Um, it has a sort of downtown area where, where people who live um, in the houses around it will walk over, ride their bikes over um, and it's also a destination. Um, you know, where you can drive from any other area of Columbus and go and, and eat and maybe catch a movie or have some coffee and then some ice cream. So we like the neighborhoods um, where we can 
um, well, we're not the destination, but the neighborhood is the destination. So we can open, um, and you, you know, our customers come park once, and they do a whole bunch of different things, and they walk around maybe with ice cream at the end or something like that. And so we always choose little tiny spaces, and Grandview was perfect for that. And, um, and still, all of our stores are sort of um, in the same model. And really, your company is of Columbus, and, and uh, back to the idea of the, you know, don't have the mountains, don't have the uh, oceans or whatever, but you, it is reflective of Columbus because you draw uh, from its authentic resources, as well as elsewhere, but that's what it's based on as a, as a principle almost, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, and, pr- and we're very proud of that. Yeah. In my first book, I, I have a little essay on, um, on, um, on flavor is what surrounds you. You know, um, and that you just you don't have to go very far. And you know, my favorite place on the planet is the library. Um, I couldn't travel for so many years, even while I was making ice cream. And so what happened was, all the people who went to Italy came in to me at the counter, and they were like, "Oh, you know, you've obviously been to Italy. You know this." And I was like, "No, no, I haven't. Well, you've got to get to Italy. The ice cream is the best in the whole world." And all I did was imagine like what this could possibly be like, this amazing Italian ice cream. And so, of course, I, would, I spent just so much time in the library and, and do, even still to this day, um, reading about all of that and traveling in my mind and thinking about what that is. And, and even now we say we don't try to make the better ice cream than the next guy um, or the best ice cream in Columbus or Ohio or America or the world even, right, or the universe. We try to make the best ice creams we can imagine. We are doing that. So we get better every single day because what you imagine is actually better than what ex- exists. And you better believe when I got to Italy, the ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> But you know when you can do that when you th- when you when you um, when you imagine that. There was something that Jenny just said in there. She slipped in that may may have gone under the radar. But she said her first book, which means that her second book is about to be released, which is really exciting. Yes, so. and in the second book, the essay oh, there's a little essay at the end of the books that's whatever is about company as community, and the the word company means that you're not alone, and that um, we built our company as like this ship. And it started off with me in the rowboat on a little creek. And now we're like this nice, pretty cool ship uh, going across the ocean through the waves with this community of people who are amazing. And our community um, is, of course, the people who work at Jenny. It's about 400 of us. Um, but it's also our, our um, producers, farmers, near and far. We work with direct buyer vanilla bean directly from a farm in Uganda. Um, and also our customers. And we think of everybody as all sort of together moving forward. So maybe that French customer said, it's ship. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it came from. So we have no water here, right? Yeah. But ships are always my metaphor in trains, too. But um, for some reason, I don't, ever, I, don't get on, I don't go on boats very often. But anyway, I think of it a lot. So the thing that Jenny won't talk about much is sort of what her brand has done for Columbus globally. Um, and you may know that story already, but she has some exciting news that I want her to share about her new deal with, um, I asked her, how many stores are you in retail? And she said about 1,500. Well, maybe 2,000. So tell are we us. Are supposed to share that now? No, you don't have to. <laughs> um, but you don't have to. It's OK. It doesn't matter. You'll all know soon enough anyway. But um, no, we're going we're, we're gonna to be in 250 targets, target stores, um, along with, and what made us made, make our mind up was that some of our really good um, uh, friends in the world of food and, and flavor um, are also making that decision. So Siggy's Yogurt is somebody we, we love and know well, and then also um, uh, Intelligentsia Coffee, which is another Midwestern company that we love. Um, and so we got this little group of sort of really well-made products, so we'll see how that goes. And that's really fun, and that's been a really fun um, discovery um, and, and partnership that we've created. We've had a lot of fun with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and yeah, it's, it's going to be really fun. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Yeah, Thank you. Very cool. Thanks. Just delay for a month. Right. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So we had a few other spatterings of stories, but we'd love we have about 10 minutes if there's uh, anything else that you want to dig into. And Can I just, um, I'll make oh. a quick thing. Oh, I mean, one free. thing that I think about a lot, and when I'm out talking about our ice creams, um, I always end up talking about Columbus a lot. Um, just because that's, I think, who we are at our, in our hearts or whatever. But, um, but Columbus is right at the crossroads of, th- we talk about not having our waterways and our mountains or whatever. We are, we are sitting right at the crossroads of three distinct American regions. Um, 
I always say 20 minutes north, that's probably an hour north, but 20 minutes north and you're in the northeast and everything changes, the food, the accents and everything. And you go 20 minutes south and you're in the south, probably an hour. You are actually, you feel like you're in the south. And, and 20 minutes or an hour west and you're in the Midwest. I'm from Peoria, Illinois originally. And um, to me, Columbus isn't the Midwest. And neither is Cleveland or Cincinnati, but Dayton maybe. Um, so this idea that this, all of these cultures converge right here is pretty neat, and that Ohio is actually divided into three different regions, and it's Columbus that's right in the middle. And I feel like that gives us a really neat advantage. I mean, um, not just in terms of getting our ice cream where we want it to go, but in, in, in terms of understanding other people. And when we opened up in Nashville or Atlanta or Chicago or when we go to Brooklyn and New York, which I was just there last week, people know us and we sort of know them too. I think there's a really, whereas when I'm in Peoria and I love Peoria, it doesn't feel that way. So I think it is a really special location that we have here um, that makes a difference in the way that we understand the world. Nancy Kramer's often asked, uh, could you have grown your company in another city? Well, the answer for me is absolutely not. In fact, Charlie almost got a job in New York, my husband, uh, right before we opened Jenny's. And I often reflect on that because I don't think there would have been any way we could have taken that and done this ice cream in New York. Um, <clears throat> I think not only for all of the hurdles that it may have been just to uh, pay for a store and have a store there and get all the products that we need and, and do that. But also, um, I think having the eyeballs on you um, would have been a lot of pressure to get it right from the beginning. And I don't think we, we did. I think it took some time to do that. But also, once we started getting it right, um, you know, having somebody, you know, another company come in and sort of take the idea, that would have definitely happened. It's happened recently, uh, and we're very well equipped to deal with it now. But, um, you know, I think that would have been a big big issue for us. So I, uh, as I'm listening, I'm you know, reinforcing some of the messages that have come through over the last couple of days. So uh, one of them is, uh, you know, size matters. And that uh, you may say, you know, you're not on the water and, and perhaps, you know, uh, you have, uh, you, you don't have the same geographic advantage as some other places might have. But you also have then, as a result, something completely different that happens locally. It's almost like a pioneering ethic yeah. where you depend on each other. Uh, and so size and location uh, creates a certain ecosystem. Yeah. And that ecosystem suggests that uh, by having a certain size the way you are today, you also have a certain attitude. And that attitude seems to suggest, as Jenny was saying, that you're a company that you're together, that you're not alone. And that dependency, because you're not geographically um, situated to be distracted, right. you are focused on each other. Yeah. And as a result, uh, the ecosystem is very different here. It's then reinforced, and it's reinforced by good governance. Uh, good governance creates confidence. Confidence creates investment. Uh, and it allows growth. But that growth doesn't seem to be uh, unrivaled growth. It's, it's one that allows for you know, participation, acceptance, that's what I'm hearing. And I'm hearing that uh, uh, there's this concept of relationship building and dependency that comes out of that. So when we were talking earlier, uh, uh, a couple of times now in, in the community, I came here uh, with uh, not preconceived notions, but, but I had uh, read a number of different things, and I kept saying, for the size of the population, 800 some odd thousand, it sounds like you should be a couple of million people. And I kept wondering why that was the case. And uh, I said to uh, uh, my colleagues uh, today and, and previously, there seems to be something different here in that uh, when you have all these good things happening and you have this relationship that, that builds up, that makes up for critical mass. Uh, so you have these huge cities that you expect these things to happen because they have critical mass. Uh, but when you don't have critical mass, what you have is strong relationships. And that seems to be what makes up the difference. Pew uh, Research did a study uh, with the Knight Foundation of, of 26 cities over a three-year period, and they've renewed that since, about what distinguishes successful cities, and reduce it down uh, to one salient point that I gravitate towards, which is the emotional bond people, people feel with their community. 
And that emotional bond that people feel with this community and being on the trajectory of growth that we can all help co-create uh, is, is absolutely present and palpable and makes a difference in the level of engagement, which will make a difference in the opportunities for the future. But it's the same organization that came up with the uh, same notion of how do you retain uh, the talent yeah. and uh, this concept of stickiness. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Knight Foundation came up with three points that I always take around the world. Mm -hmm. How do you create a successful city and keep uh, attracting and retaining talent? Well, uh, you have affordable housing, and so you're trying to do that in places like Franklin. And, uh, you have accessible and affordable transit. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, things to do. Mm -hmm. And so part of this discussion around heritage, the arts, and attitude are about things to do. Mm -hmm. And so over the last two days, mostly, I've been seeing the kinds of things that you do here. And I have to say, there's a lot to do here. <laughs> We so. Mm -hmm. so I'll just wrap up since we're at the end with a, one other statistic that Doug and I actually collaborated on. Um, at TEDx Columbus last October, we had an audience of 750 people, and we asked them to answer one question for us on a note card. We passed out the note cards, and we got about almost 600 responses. You know, some people were still getting lunch and coming back in the room. And the question was, do you feel like you can fulfill or reach your potential living in Columbus, or have you reached your potential living in Columbus? We, we, we had no idea what the answer was going to be. And um, we got the note cards back, and we're reading them and reading them, and 95% of them had exclamation points on them saying, yes, absolutely. And the 5% that said no, all of them sort of had asterisks that said, you know, but I just moved here, or I haven't tried hard enough. And we thought that that was a really great. Now, granted, our sample were people who opted to come to a kind of a an event like that but it, it a little bit is a cross-pollination and a, a little microcosm of our community of people who are really reaching their potential to your point there's lots to do here indeed so any final thoughts from my great panel We're just glad you, yeah glad you're enjoying your stay and hopefully uh when this is all over and done uh we'll be able to celebrate as the uh, most intelligent community. <laughs> Open invitation. I have to say that. Open invitation to come back to a performance. And I, I, I get a sense, although you have to be careful about um, declaring yourself vis-a-vis -vis <laughs> other cities, that you have felt the palpable spirit of Columbus. So I want to give you an honorary pin <laughs> saying the spirit of Columbus <laughs> that you can wear proudly around the world to the other cities competing with <laughs> <laughs> Have to wear a lot of badges. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Wear this. Thank you for your time Thanks. and for Thank entertaining oh, this well, conversation. This was great. Thank you very much for organizing this. Great. And such an august group of people that uh, I, I really feel honored being here. So thank you very much for your time. As the well. feeling is mutual. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have been watching Community as Canvas. Its purpose was to discuss the dimensions of Columbus culture for John Jung, co-founder for the Intelligent Community Forum. To find out more about the ICF and Columbus's place in the competition, you can visit their website at intelligentcommunity.org.